Tales from the Tavern was recorded in front of a live Twitch audience. I'm Commander Shepard, and Tales from the Tavern is my favorite stream on Twitch. Hello, hello, everybody. We are back with another week of Tales from the Tavern. I hope you all are doing well and have had a wonderful weekend so far. Uh, I have a fantastic group of guests with me here tonight. Um, as you can see, we also have Steve the Baby Dragon joining us tonight. Unfortunately, one of our guests fell ill at the very last minute. And um, so we we hope that, Tyler, you are feeling better. Um, and uh, we're going to look to get Tyler on in June at some point. We can't book him in May because he's getting married in May. So good luck, Tyler. Um, hope all goes well. And we will look to have you on again in June. And um, so what I would like to do right now is I would like to start by going around, having all of our guests introduce themselves and tell us a little about who they are and what they do and where we can find them on social media. And then I'll tell you all a little about how the stream works if this is your first time hanging out tonight. So, um, Evie, we're going to start with you. <laughs> Hey, I am Evie or Evie. I really don't care. Stop asking. Uh, the <laughs> um, I do the DMing and pretty much everything production wise for the AP podcast D and Disaster Story, which is about six completely insane, chaotic characters that all dumped intelligence and got locked into a contract that they legitimately couldn't even read and are stuck on an island for a year with each other. Oh, no. <laughs> that sounds yeah. hilarious. It's ridiculous. Um, somehow potatoes got involved and are now the language of love for them. I, I don't know. I stopped trying to predict what they're doing. I also can occasionally be found on a variety of uh, streams running something called the Chaos Party, which is an entirely improv tabletop game. No rules, no system, all improv dice will be involved. We never know which one because it's up to the mood of the moment. Um, and now announcing, like, this is literally when things are being announced. I will be running something called Into the Fog with Bards and Brews every other Tuesday, starting the last Tuesday of this month. It is a Strahd-inspired dark fairy tale D&D &D homebrew campaign. That sounds amazing. And uh, I hope it goes well. We were just saying before we came on that uh, we love all the people over at Bards and Brews. So I'm sure it will be a great success. And uh, awesome. they are great. I love them. Yes. Um, Wayne, welcome. Tell us a little about yourself. Hello. Well, I'm Wayne, and I'm the creative director and head dungeon master at Adventure Away. Um, we are a D&D &D bed and breakfast. So visitors can come join us and book for weekends of role-playing gaming. Um, we provide two nights stay um, accommodations plus all meals catered, as well as continental breakfast. And we provide a house DM. I'm our first DM. We've grown in the last couple of years. We now have uh, three coming up, four on staff Dungeon Masters to run games for our customers. We usually play fifth edition to keep things light. Um, new players and older welcome. We've had people that came back after only playing first edition. We've got people that have never tried before, people that are out there on the circuit playing, uh, you know, Adventures League. And we are very happy to have you come and game with us. And 
that's kind of my shtick. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at AdventureWayMD. You can also find me on Twitter and TikTok under Wayne Denier. You'll probably see lots of food posts. I, pr- I promise they're mine, though. I'm not just posting other people's food. <laughs> um, I, I know that I personally was looking at your website a lot in the last week, and I'm like, I really need to get there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it looks it fantastic. Flow. And uh, yeah, I really hope to make it down at some point. So that would be great. Um, Lydia, tell us a little about you. Hi. Uh, during the day, I write monster romance stories. Um, and starting this Friday, I will be a cast member on Rangers of the North, which will be a Lord of the Rings inspired all female RPG game over on DMDM Studios uh, Twitch channel. I love the folks over at DMDM Studios. They're good people, too. <laughs> they are. They're great. Yes. Um, and the Lord of the Rings Rangers of the North looks like a really cool system. I was going to do a one-shot of it at one point and then got sick that weekend, so I didn't get to play, but it looks very cool, so I hope it goes great. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. We have, like, they have a, some good uh, RP mechanics in there, so yeah. I've, I've got, like, flaws and stuff already built into my character from the game, so I'm excited to, to play around with that. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I am definitely interested in, uh, in learning more about it in the future. So, yeah. All right. And Matt. Hello, I'm Matt. I'm a game master who can't shut up. I just talk about games all the time. I love tabletop RPGs so much and nobody wants to listen to me except for the people who listen to my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) And and, I, and and all these fine, lovely folks, you know, this community has really given me a place to talk about the things that some of the folks in my personal life don't want to listen. Anyway, I'm rambling. Uh, Roleplay Chat. I'm the host of Roleplay Chat, which is a bi-weekly tabletop RPG deep dive discussion podcast. Every other week, I'm joined by a different guest from the tabletop RPG community. I've had some fantastic folks like Luna join me for a talk. Scott, who's in chat from Zeal or Zeal Zaddy, he's joined me for a chat. Uh, most recently, I got the privilege to talk to Jeremy Cobb from the Three Black Halflings. He's a, he had a, a fun of really great stories to tell. So anyway, we you know I, I me and the guest we pick a topic and we deep dive, giving our tips and strategies and stories and anecdotes about that particular topic. And uh, yeah, it can be listened to wherever you listen to podcasts. So just look for Role Play Chat, and that's Role as in Role Play, so R O L E. And uh, yeah. That's that's uh, that's the show, and I look forward to the the deep dive that we're going to take tonight with the, all the questions from chat. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a great podcast, and um, yeah, I I know I enjoyed coming on, and I know I've seen you've had some really great guests on. Um, so yeah, definitely check it out. Um, And I am Gamer Mom Luna. This is Tales from the Tavern. If you are joining us for the first time, let me tell you a little about how the stream works. So uh, our panel here takes all of our questions from chat. So if you would like to ask any questions of uh, anyone and everyone here in the in the group, uh, please feel free to drop uh, your questions right into chat. And one of the moderators will make sure that it makes its way to me so we can um, we can get it into the list. If you've been around for a little while and you've got some channel points racked up, we do have the Ask My Question Next feature. So for a thousand channel points, you can have your question bumped up to the next one in the queue. And um, and uh, we will we will answer it as soon as we get to the next question. So, uh, yes, Scott, unfortunately, one of our guests fell ill tonight. So uh, so he was unable to make it. Um, so we have Steve, the baby dragon, who will uh, silently be playing with his giant squishy D20 uh, in the in the upper corner for the evening. So it'll be it'll be good. It'll be fine. Um, he stays right there. We don't have to feed him too much. It's all right. Uh, so I'm going to get the ball rolling, uh, or should I say get the dice rolling? Ha ha. And, uh, and I'm going to start off by asking a question that I ask, especially when I have a lot of new people on for the first time. And that question is, if you are playing at a physical table with actual dice, do your dice have to match? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No. See, no. this is such a divisive question. It happens all the time. <laughs> well, I will have like multiple happens. sets out, but like if I roll like the blue d twenty, then it's like the blue damage dice. Uh, yeah, it all has to match. Mine have to be themed, so I'll like have sets that are themed around what's happening. 
but I don't, while I have purchased sets, I don't explicitly keep them together. And that's because I do have favorite D20s and such. But at this point, because I'm almost always the DM, there is no way to do just <laughs> the matching set. There is physically no way to do it. <laughs> that's a really good point. I... Never thought of it that way, but yeah, I, I just don't ever have matching sets anymore because all my dice go in a big... I have like a chest, a little wooden chest, and they all just get dumped into that. I And I just don't bother to try and, and find them. But I do like them to sort of have a theme. You know, if we're fighting a big like tree folk monster thing, you know, they're going to be green and brown. And like, I try to, try to pick out the ones that kind of match one another thematically, but there's never a whole lot of thought put into it. <laughs> I definitely start with them all mixed but then like over the course of a whole game i will have marshaled them into their own little military units and the matching colors like i'm ready to go to battle <laughs> that's amazing what I, about you luna i am very much a all of my dice have to match including like i even have multiple sets of just D, of matching d6s just in case and um and not only that, but I have to go so far as they are all stored separately from each other. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like having them all in one big thing, like I would just, oh, it would make me crazy. But um, <laughs> yeah, I just can't do it. Like even right now, sitting here on my desk, like I can tell I have one set in here. I have a set right here. I have a set right here. I have this little teeny tiny set. I have a set right here. I've got two sets of D6s sitting directly in front of me. Um, and that's just what's within immediate arm's reach without going into any of my drawers. So, so, uh, yeah. But the funny thing is, is that I could tell you what set is in what, like, what container without even having to open it. So, so, yeah, I'm just weird like that. Do you have, like, special sets? Like, do you buy any of those fancy, like, the ones with, like, flowers cast into them and stuff like that? So, these ones, um... I got these actually just a couple weeks ago, and I've gotten to play with them once since then. Uh, oh, you can't really see it in that one. Um, Bring them, I want to see them. Bring them closer. Uh, these, <laughs> these have teeny tiny little shells in them. Oh, that's so cool. Whoa. So I have those. Oh. And then I also have, which I'm not going to grab right now because they're up on a shelf above me. Um, but I have the Keyfish Crit Dice from uh, Greedleaf Geek. So those have little tiny, like, orange goldfish in them. <laughs> um, and those are super cute. And then another set oh. that I have, um, and I, I can't fully demonstrate them on stream because it takes a little bit of time, but these are a color-changing metal set. So they are blue right now, but if I were to hold it in my hand for a little while, they'd turn purple. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, like mood, like mood rings. Yeah, that's exactly nice. what it is. It, I was gonna say it works kind of like a like a mood ring. So, yeah, those are fun. Um, I rarely ever use them though because they're uh, they're metal and they're yeah. loud. I have a set like that. The D four is great for like picking at my cuticles with. When I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hadn't thought of that, but now that you mention it. <laughs> Yeah. You need to add many petties to your uh, to your to your bed and breakfast, <laughs> where you exclusively you use dice to. <laughs> That's a a, um, a job I did not expect I would have in my career. <laughs> yeah. <Sorry. laughs> oh my goodness! All right. Well, we are starting to get a few questions that are coming in from chat, so uh, let's jump right in. The first one comes from the Dimpire. Hello, Jim. I hope you are well. And Jim would like to know, what is your favorite crit fail or crit success moment that you were at the table for? Oh, I, I know that. I... The moment, but then I forget them immediately when I walk away. <laughs> I have, a, I I have did... a moment while people think about it. I have a, I'll have a quick one. Um, sorry, Evie. I didn't, I didn't realize I was talking over you. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm gesturing for you to go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I was a player you know, on a rare occasion. I was a player and we were playing in this homebrew world where we were basically trying to save this group of, of, of people who were kind of enslaved, not really enslaved, but 
in, in, in like this like caste system where they weren't being treated properly and we were trying to liberate them and, and kind of remove their oppressor. And we got into this dialogue with a group of them. We were vastly outnumbered. We were we, we were in trouble. And my character kind of stepped up and was like, no. Like I and tried to appeal to the to the to the people there. It's like this isn't right. Like you you know, there, where's the humanity in what you're doing? And it was going to be one of these really impossible situations, you know, like there's no way that you're going to convince them that what they're doing is wrong. So I rolled and I got a crit. I crit on my, di it was diplomacy on my diplomacy check. And, you know, there was some of the people started to turn and then the game master was like, you know what, roll again. Let's see, let's see what happens. Like roll again to see if like you swayed enough people, the tides turn and they like, everybody overturns this like ruler person. I rolled again. I got a second natural 20 in a row. And he was like, okay, it's done. Like you've, <laughs> you've overthrown this group. Like not even having to pick up a sword, you've convinced and like appealed to them. And it was, uh, it felt really good. It felt really good. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. I want to say that I have one, have one from a Strahd game. Um, but, you know, just because it's always, like, something really big and bad that shouldn't possibly be able to die that gets, like, completely felled. And we ran it um, in a brief, like, one shot. And there was to be a wedding between Arana um, and Strahd. But the party was totally there to crash that wedding. And they they came up against them, and Strahd was there with his squad, too. But, like, one of the monks had just weaved their way through dodging um, opportunity attacks and had the sun blade and then just, like, opened them up, like, top to bottom. There was a massive crit. And then the radiant vulnerability as well. There, would, there was a really tense moment leading up to that where, like, one of the other players had come up to confront him, and then the monk just sweeped in and then took him out. And, you know, it was one of those earth-shattering moments where, you know, you've, like, really kind of lifted Barovia out of the, the plane of dread. And just had to, like all the windows blow out at once, and the sun comes in, and all the vampires are dust. It was definitely like the mic drop moment. So thank you, Miss. Thank you, Monk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while you guys finish thinking up for a minute, I just want to shout out: we just got raided twice. Uh, once by Paradise Productions, my good buddies over there at Paradise Productions. So hello, welcome in uh, everybody coming from Paradise, and uh, welcome in to everybody coming from Dork Tales. Nice to have you all here. Uh, this is Tales from the Tavern. If you've never seen this before, this is a TTRPG talk show where chat asks all of the questions. So stick around, drop some questions into chat, and we will answer them for you. Uh, right now we are discussing the best uh, crit fails or best crit successes we've ever been at the table for. <laughs> Some dork tales. Oh. Oh, <laughs> I keep hesitating on mine because the crit fail is kind of a gore content warning, and I don't know how appropriate that is for the discussion. Ah, well, we are an 18 plus channel, so I, I can throw okay. that out. So I would say if you feel like it's appropriate, then you could go ahead okay. and share it. Yeah. So um, this was with the disasters before we started recording. So unfortunately, we do not have it on the podcast for everyone to laugh at. Mm -hmm. But the group of chaotic little gremlins decided that they wanted to use the body of a recently defeated goblin chief to intimidate whatever might still be left behind in the cave that they had inhabited um, and rolled a nat one to throw the body at the cave um, and how it had been dispatched was a slice to the neck so the head fell off in the process on top of one of them which pissed off the monk who wanted to then kick the head at the, at the cave and rolled a second mat one in a row. So it got stuck to his foot. <laughs> he ended up dancing around, kicked his foot in the air with this dead goblin's head stuck to the tip of his foot because he's a bugbear, so there's claws there. 
Oh, that's the weekend uh, at Bernie's sequel. I didn't know I needed it. Right? <laughs> it, 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 was, it was horrible because it landed on the dwarf who's basically a princess. So she's filthy from the corpse landing on her. And he, like, gets pissed off, tries to kick the head of the goblin uh, chief at the cave, which was empty. It turned out that it was empty. Got the head stuck to his foot because he rolled a second nat one in a row. Oh, These guys roll so many nat ones. Um, <laughs> that's horrible. Oh, um, no. And that's really tied for when they were on watch for whatever reason and said princess dwarf tried to roll perception and rolled nat one on that and noticed the um, Kenku who is modeled after a hooded crow. So it has the white markings. Has a couple of white markings on his face that look kind of like eyebrows. And she got distracted by that particular feature. Became obsessed with them from that. Started talking about how they look like eyebrows and they are mesmerizing to the rest of the group. So it is now a running trope in our game that the Kenku, who is the most terrifying member of the party, is powered by the eldritch magic of his eyebrows. So we occasionally <laughs> have him roll a charisma check as roll for eyebrows, and it gives him, like, advantage on something. And if, if he succeeds, and the first time we had him do that, he rolled a nat 20. <laughs> so, like... The few times they actually roll a natural success, it's for stupid shit, like rolling for eyebrows. Of course. And they become extra mesmerizing. <laughs> it's like the cartoon they're, they're equivalent always. of like a cartoon character waggling his eyebrows at something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The eldritch power of the Kenku eyebrows. <laughs> They should become their own patron. Like that should be some another warlock's patron oh. is the Kenku's <laughs> eyebrows. No, there, there is there is a way for sorcerers to essentially become minor patrons yeah. to warlocks. So I'm considering <laughs> giving his eyebrows sorceress power, and people can have conversations with the eyebrows mostly by staring at them for long enough. <laughs> oh my god, I love that so much. <laughs> because there is nothing serious about the way that these players play this campaign, so own it. Yeah. yeah. Gotta lean in. The eyebrows only speak in motivational phrases like, you got it, girl. <laughs> there are a thousand grains of sand on the beach. No need to be stressed. Gotta look up the cheesiest ones. Yeah. Always. <laughs> so good. Did you have one, Lydia? Or I don't... Like I said, I never remember rolls after I walk away from the table. Yeah. Like, I just don't. I Because I get asked that question a lot, and I can never remember, like, specific rolls like that. I was trying to... I was trying to think of... Um, some of mine and I <laughs> there was one in particular and this happened like two years ago so the fact that I still remember it was is is pretty entertaining in and of itself um my party I I was a player and the party was uh basically in this like abandoned building um that we had sought out it was like a I don't even remember, but the type of building is irrelevant. And so we were, we had been told like this person that we needed to find was using this as a hideout. And so we go in, we find out sure enough, he's there using it as a hideout. And so we get into a fight and <laughs> it actually wasn't one of the party members that rolled the nat one. It was the enemy that we were fighting and he rolls a nat one during the during the battle and the GM was using a fumble table and as a result he punched himself in the groin <laughs> <laughs> and managed to like stun himself for like four rounds and, and we were like 
That's it. it like, low. we could have just walked higher. away at that point. <laughs> like, what's he gonna do? It was, we were dying laughing because it was like this really intense moment in the game. And then just all of a sudden, this guy just wham punches himself in the groin. We were like, dead, dead. That's it. <sighs> did, did he die? Because four four rounds being stunned is is not. Uh... Yeah, he did not actually. Um, the the way that the the way the GM had the campaign set up was that he was he was meant to get away anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So he had a a lot of hit points. Like we were not supposed we were supposed to find him that early. We were not supposed to defeat him that early. So. Like, we were able to wail on him for quite a while and did virtually nothing. But we were also super low level at that point. Like, we okay. were, like, yeah. at level two or something. So, yeah. Um, all right. Let's hmm. see. Um, oh, my gosh. We got another raid from Barnes & Brews. <laughs> Hello, friends. friends. <laughs> we were talking in. about you earlier. I know. We were just saying all the good things about our friends over at Bards and Brews. So welcome in. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, this is Tales from the Tavern, and we are answering questions from chat. So um, if you have any questions for our panel, feel free to just go ahead and drop those in, in the chat, and we will, we will make every attempt to get to those. Uh, speaking of, we're going to jump to our next question, which, which comes from uh, Cranky Old Wizard, and goes back to our dice conversation. And the question is, do you have DM dice separate from player dice? No. <laughs> <laughs> the set of metal dice, dice that I will hunt down to use as player dice. Like, I will find within my collection, which much like uh, my friend on the panel here, is just all piled into a giant glass that's shaped like a skull. And I will dig through those for a good hour to find the specific ones that I want to use for a character. Um, But I don't keep them separately. I have like a little away bag, so like if I don't feel like taking the whole deal, I'll just you know d- dig out a set and just do that in like one mini, and then a couple of the little glass counters for for fun emergencies. I do buy a new set of dice if I'm gonna be joining like a lot, like like a, you know a campaign that's gonna run for a decent you know twelve games, or ten games or more. I'll go and I'll go to my local game store, buy a new set of dice. And I'll use that set of dice the first time when I'm a player, but then it just goes into my chest and then I have a hard time finding them. So it's 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 kind of like this uh adds to the collection, but it's not it's not really a separate set of dice for all sakes and purposes. <laughs> yeah. It's I just have... an excuse to buy dice. Sorry. You always need an excuse to buy dice though. Like Oh, I don't need an excuse. <laughs> I just will. <laughs> yeah. You just need more dice. Always need more dice. Yeah, I have one set of like heavy metal dice. So they make like the good noise when you're all on the table. So I'll use those for my DM dice because I'm that jerk that if they like get into the planning phase too long or like talking, we'll just start rolling the loud dice behind the screen just to freak them out. (laughs) I've straight up gotten the timer from Trivial Pursuit and just put it on the other side of the screen. Yeah, (laughs) there. There you go. Yeah, Ikea sells really nice timers actually. Um, They're like, five minutes i think which is like a pretty sweet spot so you're like okay you pull it out you turn it over let's go like let's let's go (laughs) nice very fancy hourglass well not actually an hour uh, that i use for special occasions when i'm like that nice yeah it's good to add that little bit of tension you know when they know they have a a real time limit versus you know fantasy time limit slowly closing (laughs) Yeah. yeah I mean, there's nothing stopping you from drawing, like, a circle on the whiteboard or whatever and just, like, pieing it into, like, a six-piece pie chart and just, like, scribbling in to one of the triangles that, oh, five, oh, you scribble a little bit more. <laughs> oh, you keep going. And then it brings the tension up. And you don't, you know, you might not even know as the Game Master why you're doing it other right. than to make them, like, move along. But <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's it's an uh, interesting strategy that I like to employ sometimes. That works. <laughs> Sometimes it's needed. Sometimes it's really needed. 
just a marker board and you just go up and write some runes. And they're like, what does that mean? It's like, oh, these are appearing on the walls around you. You don't really know what they mean yet. <laughs> Buy yourself some time as the GM too. Like, I don't really know what they yeah. mean either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Googling younger Futhrock runes. <laughs> For some reason, you begin hearing Jeopardy music. Your characters don't even know what Jeopardy is, but somehow the sound begins echoing in their minds. Yeah, that's nice. And then one of the NPC, like an NPC runs in with a letter for Sir Alex uh, or something, you know? Yeah. This letter's for you. I'm sorry, could you put that in the form of a question? <laughs> uh, this letter? Uh, thank you. It's even better if it's for someone that none of them there are there, like someone that they have never heard of or that they've heard of but is not present at that moment. What this letter for? <laughs> you. And then you play that. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man, I did a I did a game, um, a fundraiser. A, uh, I can't remember if it was a year or two ago, but either way, I think it was a year ago. And like thinking on it now, like oh man, all of those things would have fit in so well, like all those little game show sound effects, because the whole thing was set like in a bowling alley that, you know, like a space bowling alley that had an arcade attached to it. And yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a missed opportunity, Luna. You should have had like every other NPC been a different game show host. Right. You know, I, just... It wasn't, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't in charge of it. I was just playing in somebody else's creation. And, uh, uh but like, okay, okay. in retrospect, I'm like, I, I need to go back and talk to them. Like, right now i'll be back in a minute i gotta go have this conversation with these guys so <laughs> <laughs> so when we do it again <laughs> instead of combat it's just actually playing the game show you're playing like family feud the top five answers for what to bring your bugbear for lunch <laughs> <laughs> yes you know what that would be a really really fun like fundraiser or charity right game. i'm just saying oh, yeah. that right now Molly, you have a twin on the camera. Look at Oh, kitty kitties. <laughs> She's not really a lap kitty. She's a let me choose to sit next to you, kitty. Maybe you'll pet. Mm. Oh, yeah. No, Molly will hang out right next to me for quite a while now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we should do it. That, that's that's the call out for we have to do a charity game where combat is game show and like sign me up I mean, I'd love to <laughs> I do have a weekend long extra life charity event coming up in July so <laughs> there we go good cause good cause that's I, I like that I like that idea a lot oh my gosh you're cutting out there Luna uh, sorry I was just saying that I, I like that idea a lot <laughs> mm. <laughs> yep um all right. Uh, let's see. So the next question that we have comes from the Everyday Superhero Cast, uh, also known as Julian. And Julian would like to know. Husband. Julian would like to know how did you find your way to tabletop role playing games? When did they come into your life? <laughs> Wayne's like chomping at the bit for this one. I can see it already. Sorry, that means I don't have to think. <laughs> All right, well, since I'm queued up, I guess I'll go. Go for um, it. I yeah. was mostly a video game enthusiast in my childhood through high school, and then I got into Warhammer 40K, so a little bit of historical miniature stuff, and then PC gaming and Nintendo, so like I was big into Diablo and Warcraft. And then uh, a friend and mentor of mine who had AD&D version 1 books hidden in his closet in dust um, said, hey, why don't you come over? And that was uh, 14 years ago. And since then, um, I survived all of 4th edition and 5th. And I really enjoyed that first game. Um, but then I've enjoyed every game since then, almost like in like a progressive curve. Uh, like, oh, this is fun. We're running around a dungeon. There's statistics, but we're working on like Thacko and like really rough monsters. 
and then suddenly it's like, oh, there's miniatures, and I don't have to paint 300 of them like Warhammer. <laughs> and, then, and then I can do characters, and we can do role-playing voices, and, you know, I just kind of never look back. I have a weird intro into it. Um, I My partner, who may or may not have asked this question, um, runs a wellness program that is geared towards nerds. Um, and at the time, we're kind of trying to find ways to, like, get them into classes and stuff. And one of our clients, like, kept bringing up role-playing games as, like, an idea. So we actually built a class before I'd ever played a TTRPG around that concept of, like, replacing dice with exercises. Um, and it was a lot of fun, and they all had a lot of fun. And then the, the client kept giving me, like, you got to watch this stream, and you got to watch that stream. And so I started watching, like, I'm like, it's research to get ideas for the classes. And I went, like, forget the classes. Like, I, <laughs> I want to go play this now. And I had some friends who had played before and wanted to play. And we actually went onto Facebook and um, kind of found a, like, hire a GM service. And uh, found a, a professional to, like, walk us through how to play and did, like, three games with us with, like, character setup and just, like, some basic how to get into it. Um, and that was, yeah, like, five, six years ago now. Um, yeah, so it, start, it started as exercise, weirdly enough. <laughs> We're all just staring at I each other. I was going to say, I can dive in, but uh, um, I wanted to Ugh. let anybody else go if somebody else had a, had their answer ready. <laughs> well, like, I was in, I've always been into, like, writing and creating stories and everything. Like, ever since I was a little kid, I was writing fictional stories. Um, but... When I was in my first year of university at a school and program that I didn't end up continuing because stress, uh, <laughs> my best friend at school was into D&D &D and she like took me along to a couple of sessions that she was playing with a DM at our university uh, who Ironically, she actually ended up marrying. She met him through the game, and they ended up getting married. It was adorable. But I had never actually seen it played. I had heard about it. Um, and when I left that school and went into a different profession, I was back home where I had moved to school from and kind of just walked into a random basement game shop in the mall and was just like, okay, who's playing D&D? &D? Sat in on a couple of sessions, made friends with the DM that they had doing, like, the paid DM work there, and he let me be, like, guest NPCs a couple of times to learn the game um, before I actually started playing. And this is, like, back during the height of 3-5, so you needed those sessions to learn. Awesome. But uh, yeah, so I've been into it kind of ever since, off and on. Uh, once I moved down here to the hellhole that is Texas, uh, I ended up running more than I ended up playing, which I enjoy more, actually. Uh, so I only moved to 3.5 once the pandemic hit. Or not three five uh fifth edition once the pandemic hit and i actually like it more but uh i had not tried exploring into it from the complexity that is three five because i was afraid to have to learn a new system after that experience it's it's interesting that you um had such a like i want to say you were very brave in the way that you initiated your entry into this hobby because that's like that takes some serious courage to go into a store and be like, I want to learn to play this game. Somebody teach me. I, to play. <laughs> I made friends with the owner of the shop who like custom built me a magic deck because he's just like, hey, we need more girls on our magic nights. So I will build you a deck and teach you how to play it if you'll come and show up since you're apparently outgoing enough to talk to us. So it was it was like a with girls that I am interested in in one date, I am extremely shy. 
But everything else, I'm just like, hey, I'm going to walk up to you because you look friend-shaped and you don't have much of a choice on me introducing myself, but you can tell me to go away. <laughs> it's, that's, that's cool. I, that, yeah, I commend you for that. My, my geek origin story is much, uh, much less interesting. I studied math and stats in university, so there's a lot of like-minded people who study that in that field of, of, of study. And we had like this little crappy student lounge for math students in the basement of like an, an old a, a orphanage that our university had purchased. So it was like this really like derelict building. And the basement of that building was one of the old apartments for like, I guess the headmaster of the orphanage or whatever. So it was like the bigger room. It had a bathroom attached to it and everything. And we would often play board games Friday night. So someone would bring a board game and we'd play board games in the student lounge. And uh, one day somebody brought a Dungeons and Dragons player handbook. And like you could see the spark in our little nerd hearts that was like, oh, is that Dungeons and Dragons? And everybody just lost their mind. And, uh, and then we stopped playing board games and started playing tabletop role-playing games. And, and that's... Uh, the rest is history, but uh, yeah. As they Isn't say. there something magical about getting the player's handbook for the first time? And it's kind of like going into the character creator for Skyrim. It's like you just lose hours at a time looking at every class and option. What would it be like if I had a dragonborn sorcerer? No, wait, I want a halfling cleric. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> oh, it was great. This, but you get wings with this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I can be bubblegum colored. <laughs> I got into uh, TTRPGs. Um, it was uh, during 3.5. Um, it was about 14 years ago, a little over 14 years ago. And um, it was mainly because I, I was so like nerdy stuff was not in my sphere at all growing up. Like I had a super Nintendo and three games and like, that was it. And, um, you know, that was the, that was all I had, uh, other than the, well, I should say I had an Atari that I managed to score at a yard sale for like a song and, um, and like, I don't know, 10 or 15 games that came with it. Um, you know, because this was before everybody wanted to keep hanging on to their Ataris. And uh, and then I had a Super Nintendo and, like, three games. But, like, D&D was not a thing in my house. My parents are so far from, like, anything nerdy. It's not even funny. And, um, you know, so it just was not anything that I really ever was accustomed to. And so, of course, what did I do? I married a gamer. <laughs> and uh, so, like, all of a sudden I was like, what are these video games? What are these, you know, what is this Dungeons and Dragons you speak of? Um, it was one of those things that like I had heard about it, you know, sort of in the periphery, but, uh, you know, had zero experience with it. And so um, just before my daughter was born, he asked like, hey, do you mind if I start a campaign, um, you know, here at the house? We'll do it, you know, once a week or whatever. Yeah, sure. Fine. No problem. Um, so they start and I'm like, okay, I'm going to put the baby to bed. I'll see you guys all later. And then I would go to bed, you know, cause new mom, I was exhausted. And like the more they started to play the closer and closer to the dining table, I would end up each week until finally I was just like, move over. I want in on this, you know, like <laughs> I gotta, I gotta check this out. Um, and that was, I pretty much just inserted myself into the game and was like, okay. Uh, yeah. And, um, so yeah, we played 3.5, all the way until uh, it was, well, they were calling it D&D &D Next at the time. And we played 3.5 all the way until D&D &D Next. And, um, and then we, you know, we did like some playtesting of D&D &D Next. And uh, we are all avid PAX East attendees. And so we got to play some of it there. And so then, uh, then 5e released and we were like, ah, 5e. And then I got divorced. So... <laughs> So my group sort of blew up, um, mostly because like I had to move and, and all of that stuff. But, uh, uh, I would like to say I kept the entire D and D group except my ex-husband. <laughs> 
So that was a thing good that thing happened. To get the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good thing to get them the divorce. Yeah. 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 It was written into the divorce decree. No. I'm just <laughs> um, you, sh- you should flex on that. That's a, that's a win there. But right it there. was. Yeah. I considered that a win. Um, and uh, yeah. So no, that was that was more or less how I got into it. And then during the pandemic was when all of a sudden I was like, wait, there are more games than just D&D. So. <laughs> so, yeah. That was that was good. There's so many great games. There's so many good games. There's too many games to like have time to, to play. I it's, know. it's crazy. We um, let's see. I'm 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 scanning ahead. Uh, so we actually that actually brings us. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the order of two questions because that literally brings us to a question from Shan Wolf, who would like to know what are other games that people play. <laughs> Oh this is a long list. So yeah. Let's go. Yeah. I want to hear them all. I got to start writing down what I need to add to my uh, to my list of stuff to play. <laughs> like currently or historically? Yes. Because <laughs> okay. like currently I run D&D 5e, another D&D 5e that's going to start at the end of the month, the Bards and Brews into the Fog thing, um, and GURPS. <laughs> Sorry. I always add a twitch with that. Um, it's a favorite of friends. <laughs> um, but, and then of course the purely improv, there isn't actually a system one. Uh, but I have recently played uh, Visigoths versus Molgoths with uh, Amber the Space Chamber, yep. which was incredibly fun. Um, and a couple of Caltrop Core games, Caltrop Core by Titanomaki on. Uh, itch.io and twitter amazing person everyone loves lux um even i think created a really 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 basic uh caltrop core game myself called soft and fuzzy um and then like prior to that i have played a single game of fourth edition DD, which was not my thing too tactical um i have played the buffy the vampire slayer uh tabletop role-playing game i've played the xena tabletop role-playing game i've played continuum i have sat in on a couple of white wolf games um let me look at my stack over there um i have played a couple of other like little indie games that like people were testing out that I knew like a uh, amateur game designer with and um I know someone that published some book of a tabletop game that I don't remember what it's called that I ended up playing a couple sessions of that as well um and probably others that I just don't remember yeah there's so many great games I, I have I, I have a pretty long list but I'm gonna start with those that are my favorite and then Luna you cut me off uh <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want to stop me, um, but I, I'm gonna say one game that I think everybody should play is Fiasco. It's a GMless game. There's no game master, and it's role play focused, scene like role play scene focused. You can do it in one night. The narrative will start and end in one night. It makes a great one shot. So yeah, Fiasco. You can find like pay what you want rules even i think the official fiasco website has like the basic rule set for free on a pdf and if you like it i encourage you to to buy it uh but yeah it's a great game where you pick a character and you just role play scenes between you and another character and what i love about it is actually the character creation aspect of the game where it requests that you and you and one other character create a positive relationship and you and one other character create a negative, uh, like, you know, not negative, but uh, a strenuous relationship. So everybody at the table has like this triangle of, of relationships and it makes for really, really exciting role play. And I have since done that in every session zero I've ever done. Wherever we, when we create our characters, I make sure that my players have that kind of dynamic, which is a lot of fun. So yeah, fiasco. Uh, another really good one that I've been playing recently that I, I like a lot is the Fate Core system. It's incredibly simple, but it's also really collaborative in a, in the way that you create the world because players can create aspects. They're, they're like an official term of the game. They create aspects of the world. So you, you set a scene, you're, like, you're in this church, 
it's really big and there's uh, someone at the front say, saying a sermon and then a player can say and you know what it's a it's an old monastery it's all in stone they write it on a little sticky note they put it on the on the whiteboard or on the battle map that is now canon like it's officially an aspect of the environment that they're in so you you know you can do this for characters npcs yada 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 it's really it's really col- collaborative and it helps you flex and and practice that muscle of like building things together and building a narrative together and uh you know what i already feel myself rambling but i'm gonna say one other one that i i'm obsessed with right now is seventh c i've been running a pirate themed dungeons and dragons game for like two and a half years and i only just discovered seventh c which is like a maritime focused role-playing game that's I've heard that's about like that. its yeah. intention yeah it's really cool it has like special rules for building your ship special rules for the crew and like how they can react and like almost like um horde horde rules but different uh anyway seventh c it's really neat a lot of good uh, maritime stuff so if you're playing any kind of games with boats i would check it out nice i think i'm really boring i've mostly played 5e um mostly for the fact that i found that like the majority of people that are into TCRPGs know those rules. And I don't think it's necessarily the best system, but it is very easy for me to just in and take what I need and add a theme to it. And people are tend to be more comfortable because they feel like they're not having to learn a whole new system. So I tend to do that more than like look at other games. Um, outside of that, otherwise it's like really simple. Like I've played Dread a lot, which I really enjoy, which is just a Jenga tower instead of dice. Yeah, and you just keep playing until it falls down. Um, I played that a few times; really good. Um, or like Crash Pandas, like some of those really simple, just like D six rules don't even really matter games. Cool. Well, um, I I also am very focused on fifth edition now because it's standard, um, and that's very easy for players to join us that have never tried stuff before. Um, I had a large body of experience on 5th edition and the funny thing was like a couple months in I went, oh crud, this is World of Warcraft. And I just started trying to make my way out. But then I I stayed on until Next. Um, I remember Next was so revolutionary to me because you could break up your movement and I'm like, wait I can be an archer and pop out and snipe and then come back? Like, yes, this is so cool. So like 5th and Next are definitely like the sweet spot, but I'm breaking out a little bit that like I've needed a rules like game, and so kind of like Crash Pandas, there's a um, system called Rysis, and it's a D6 system, and the characters are created by just naming abilities. So you can say like I'm a shopkeep, and anything that might apply to being a shopkeep works, and then you can use your points. So oh yeah, good. that's cool. And then outside of that, I'm I'm in a Pathfinder two campaign, so you know the you know, child of uh, 3.5 rules uh, broken off. Um, they wanted to play something a little bit crunchier. And then I'm working on two new systems now um, because we want to break out into some specialty spaces for the business and do some one shots. So we're going to use Magpie Games Masks, which is based on Powered by the Apocalypse, Ooh. to do like a Marvel influenced, like Doctor Strange kind of game. And then we've also backed the Kickstarter for Avatar The Last Airbender. Mm-hmm. Me, my wife, and son are humongous Bender fans. And I even like made a little prototype version of my version of the game like 10 years ago, and I was like waiting for one to come out. And then when it finally released, I'm like, oh, this has so many of the ideas I wanted. I'm so happy. Um, so that's mostly what I'm working with. I have a RPG that I've been working on that's in beta. It's been that way for about seven years called Away Team. And and it's all about space and ships and having ship like rules and exploration, but then also going down to planets and having equipment. It's very influenced by like the movies, the alien movies, um, and with some mechanics that feel a little different for progressing that are more based on skill development. So I've got that thing in a PDF that's been almost ready to go. And it's one of those things where I just have to kill my darling, send it out and have people give me the feedback and do the hard work. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting though because there's so much out there, um, but there's no shame in being like, you know what? I don't. I found the one like, if D and D works for you, like go for it. I'm not. 
I, I, I hate those convers. Oh, not hate. Hate's a strong word, but I find like there's often this like shame of like, oh, how could you not have tried something else? Blah blah blah. blah. You know what? You found a game that works. You don't want to go out there and try something else because you don't have time to. You don't have the money to. You, you, you just don't have the desire to. Like that's a perfectly valid reason. So yeah, I, I think it was. I forget who said this, but they were like, you know what? D and D is like a hammer. It's a tool that'll just do everything. And sure, there might be a system out there that does sci-fi better, but I can still hit the thing with the hammer and it'll still go in. So, you know what? I'm just going to flex the hammer until it, because it, it works for me. I, I think that that's like, that's a perfectly valid perspective. You could, you should still try if you get the opportunity to read other rule sets, because especially as a game master, I find them inspirational mm. to how to like make your own little micro systems within the game. Even if you don't want to, you know, fully shift to that game but you know do your own thing like don't let don't let anybody tell you that you should don't don't let anybody make you feel shame for not playing other systems i think you know like not cool and there might be one that that's the... sorry go ahead i was just going to say like some of us are going to buy all those books and spend our wee hours studying them but there's enough people in our local groups that are just like well i'm here to play and i don't really want to learn more rules and then but then then you can steal from them you can steal from the systems that they don't know about but... yeah, yeah they don't I mean, they won't know any better <laughs> that's where streams are great because i learned a lot just from like watching other systems where i don't know the rules i don't have to learn anything i don't have to spend a lot of money but i'll i'll watch their story and be like oh they're doing you know this one little mechanic that's really cool i'm gonna pull that from that stream and bring it into my game yeah i, I same thing for me with listening to actual play podcasts um you know, I'll be like, oh, they do that really well in that game or, you know, um, just, you know, listening to various character builds and, and things like that. Like, oh, that's that's a neat sounding character. I want to try that another time I play that game, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I'm trying to think. So systems that I've played, obviously, I've, I mentioned D&D &D 3.5 and, and 5 uh, Pathfinder first edition. Um I am starting playing a Starfinder game this coming Tuesday offline. Well, digitally, but not streamed. Um, and let's see, Aether and Steamworks, um, Savage Worlds. Uh, let's see, the Fate Accelerated system, uh, Quest RPG, which is a lot of fun if you like a rules light system. Um, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. I know there's a lot of other little uh, New of Arden, which is out on Kickstarter. Inspire Isles, which was a Kickstarter. Um, Inspire Isles. That's yeah, good. so good. Which is also the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you haven't seen that one, that one's really cool. You learn sign language while you play it. <laughs> oh, nice. yeah, it's really cool. It's um, it's done in two versions: the ASL American Sign Language and the British Sign Language, because the the whole team is like you know from England or Great Britain or you know in that area but um yeah so they did it both in asl and bsl which is is really neat um oh yeah somebody in chat my my moderator uh just reminded me uh the mictem system i played a combat wombat um that was a lot of fun so yeah I, i've done a lot of like really little systems here and there uh on top of some of the bigger ones um i keep jokingly saying that oh the dragon age system i've played that one i forgot about that until just now um i keep jokingly saying i i have very gently been encouraged to try dming pathfinder 2e uh i keep saying that i will someday that hasn't happened just yet so <laughs> so um yeah we're getting there we're getting there uh, oh, I'm learning Exalted. Chat's reminding me I'm learning ex Exalted. So, <laughs> yeah. So I've got my hands in a lot of stuff. And I, I love it, though, because like you said, too, it's a great way to, like, learn to pull from other systems and, um, you know, kind of alternatively to what you were saying, Matt, about, like, if you find D&D &D and that's what works for you, you know, you can take that and run with it. But I also, I am also a believer that, like, if you try D&D &D and you hate it, that doesn't mean you hate all TTRPGs. <laughs> it just mm. means you don't like D&D. &D. <laughs> like, yeah. try a few more before you decide you're, it's not for you. Um, that's just Especially my... the people that say they love roleplay. 
like at the end of the day, D and D is is a combat simulator. Like that, that's when it shines is when you're playing it. And I'm, I love role play. Like I love it. It's my favorite part of the entire game. But D and D is a game that is designed to like track your resources, your spell slots, yeah. your you know all of that. There are a lot of games out there that don't do that and that do focus on the role play. So anyway, yeah, I, I think if, if if you're of that ilk and you like that kind of thing, maybe explore a few other uh, a few other role play heavy games. Definitely, if Fifth Edition is like a Ford Taurus. It's just automatic transmission. Everything does what it's supposed to do. But if there's something you're looking for out of it, like high performance speed or taking good corners or carrying stuff, um, like there's just there is a system that's better for it if that's the thing you like. Yeah. That's actually how I ended up with GURPS. Uh, my uh, three five players uh, wanted a system that they felt would suit how heavy of a role play DM I am and how much I homebrew, which GURPS is very, very rules intensive, um, but it's rules intensive for flexibility. That's why it's the generic universal role playing system. Mm. Um, so it allows you to do that, but first you have to really learn the system and it becomes very crunchy for that, which I don't like the rules heavy. That's why I'm not a fan of the actual system. The system itself is designed so well. So if that's the type of thing that you like, it is insanely customizable. So go out and try it. All right. Well, this is probably a great place for us to pause and take our break. So we are going to do that. We're going to take a quick break. Um, let everybody get up, stretch their legs, free the pee, let the dog out, whatever they need to do. I am going to leave you all with a great promo video for a game that is, well, a, a, a supplement that is currently on Kickstarter, the Disaster Hamsters Kickstarter. Uh, so I would like to leave you all with that video and uh, and then that will kick over to our to our break screen and we will see you all when we get back from the break. In a world where heroes stand tall. What the heck is that supposed to mean? Oh. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Play as adorable hamsters in Disaster Hamsters 2, an epic TTRPG book designed for 5th edition. It's more fun than you can stuff your cheeks with! The book has three parts. Ta -da! Everything you'll need to play as a hamster in 5th edition. Ta -da! A whole sanctuary full of adorable sentient animals for your hamsters to explore. Ta -da! Hold up! Adventure? I'm so confused! How am I even talking right now? I have so many questions! The nefarious scientist Jerry Hilliot has perfected the process of creating sentient hamsters. Now, for a final test, he's dropped his experiments into the sanctuary to see how they fare. Not only must they survive, but they must also defeat the tyrannical kitty Snuggles to escape to freedom. This is awesome! We need your support for Disaster Hamsters 2 to happen. We'd love to have you on the team. All right, we are back from our break. Hope you all had a good uh, chance to step away for a couple of minutes and, um, you know, refill your drinks and free the pee and all that good stuff. So we're going to dive back into some of the questions that we have. Uh, let's see. The next one that we are going to go to comes from Gum. Gum would like to know what has been the coolest to you theme that has come up in a game. Themes. Oh man, themes, themes. Themes are interesting because, anyway, I'm not going to dissect the, the th but yeah, themes can be a lot of things. Um, I, I think one theme that we addressed 
in one of my games was freedom. So we we talked a lot about the freedom to do what you want as a pirate, but also the like limitations of that freedom. So I, I tried to push that theme to the limit, and that was kind of fun to to give my players the flexibility to raid another ship and suffer the consequences if they get caught, that kind of stuff. So I kind of played with that idea. I find that the best themes are the ones that have kind of these two extremities to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to hear others, you know, refute that or agree with me. And I'm happy to have the conversation about it. But yeah, when there's kind of two extremes and you kind of bounce between those two extremes throughout your game, presenting situations where there's like, in my case, there was no freedom. Here are people who are enslaved by, you know, they're, they're working on the boat and you got to set them free or, or make a decision versus you have the open sea at your doorstep. Where do you go? You have complete freedom. So things like this. Um, yeah. I don't know if the game theme, but I noticed a trend in like the last three characters I've created have had a backstory that has been related to a relationship or usually some sort of like bad breakup. So rather than, I was kind of playing off of like the classic, like parents got killed by a dragon and now I'm an adventurer. And like my last three characters were like, my boyfriend left me and now I'm going to go stab things. <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of was a theme that like started to carry over for like several different characters that I created. I mean, seems valid to me. <laughs> Right? Yeah. yeah. I've really only run one theme, and that's chaos. Like, playing a character, like, one of the characters that, and that's probably having to do with the very first DM that I ever had, because well, he was very skilled with story and DMing, there was one very toxic trait to him in that he hated lawful characters and made mm. it his mission to make them either ha like come to a decision of either become chaotic or die. Um, so, like that—that that, that pretty was, intense. <laughs> <laughs> that he he hated lawful, um, and that was admittedly a very toxic trait to him. Um, but I personally enjoy playing the chaotic type characters. So, like, the one character that I got to play in 3-5 at least, um, longer while uh, down here, was insane and chaotic and to the point that the DM had to, like, shuffle her away into jail because she was so crazy and pulling away from how he viewed the story going story going i've had some interesting dms in my past uh, but uh like that kind of plays to the type of campaigns that i am running so i've got like the dm disaster story they are disasters they do weird chaotic stuff they think that rolling potato is a sign of asking someone to go out on a date um, I play, like, the extremely chaotic, like, chaos parties where there's no rules, it's just weird stuff happening. So there hasn't been a lot of themes to the games beyond the fact that a bunch of, like, chaotic shit happens. Like, I've fought Invader Zim and gotten Gur as a pet. So, like, the... Into the Fog one that I'll be running with uh, Bards and Brews is the first one that I've actually even given a major theme beyond the fact that there was a story happening. Well, I have a theme that I used uh, recently for a game on April Fools, and I took my inspiration from the boardwalk um, in our area in Maryland. There's a place called Ocean City that's not very far from the Chesapeake Bay. And it's like every ocean town you've ever been to if you've been on the East Coast. There are kite shops every three blocks. There's sensations every three blocks. There's boardwalk fries every three blocks. And I kind of wanted to play on this idea that it's both a place that everybody goes, but isn't the best, but isn't bad, but that they'll stay there because it's cheap sometimes. And if you go in the off season, you can hang out and 
it's just it's interesting how like it's such a draw in this area and i wanted to kind of capture that and i fused it with this idea i had for a pc game i was working in unreal engine called layover where you fall asleep in an airport terminal and you wake up and everybody's gone and as you start to walk past the shops like the you know newport news like the lights go out then the lights come back up on the newsstand and suddenly there's nothing but newsstands as far as the eye can see and you're trying to work your way out of this mystery and this parallel dimension that is kind of puts you in this mirror space where everything repeats and no one can leave so when i launched this the module is called wellbach pier the players arrived they hung out and then they noticed that like everybody here just kind of wants to stay here and no one can really remember how long they've been here and there's all this mystery to unfold of what dark magic has created this place and it was a lot of fun i i want to build it up and i want to use it again that's really cool yeah I would definitely, I would play something like that. Like, that sounds really interesting. Wayne, you want to go and look up the rules for Paranoia, because that sounded <laughs> exactly <laughs> like a Paranoia game. <laughs> play that. Yeah, it is so fun. I love it. I'm going to get the, like, the rules again. Uh, my notebook is getting long. After <laughs> think i have any games that have really like had a theme specifically mm. yeah not like an overt one you know um yeah i can't think of anything i do like those minor themes kind of like you were talking about with chaos and lawfulness and just like taking the mechanisms of the system and making the world rich and just kind of like knocking things together like what's a chaotic character going to do when they're confronted by the law and what, what consequences are there i mean i do like anything that challenges the assumptions so like you know chaotic being you know only destructive maybe there's a way that it's actually you know chaotic good like maybe you have to you have to break the system to build it back better or you know, the folks that are very bent towards lawfulness, realizing that it's not perfect and systems have people that are marginalized. And, you know, if you have utter faith in the system, maybe it's time to re reevaluate. You know, and I guess I'm just like a true neutral. I'm always pulling people to the middle. But there's something fun about that of just like getting people to think about what's my identity and I've chosen it, but now I have to keep making decisions in line with it. And what kind of person am I going to be afterwards? Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I find I, that those things. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Evie. No, no, no. I, I, I have interesting views on the alignment system that is used in D and D, um, and I've interpreted it in a very, very different way than a lot of people ever since three five. So it always ends up coming up as a: Do you really know your alignment? Uh, throughout any game that I am running and the only thing that I can promise any of the DMs that I work with is that my character will be chaotic. It will probably, at least usually, not actually be destructive. Um, but if you give me the ability and freedom to go completely insane, I will and I will try to convince every guard in town to wrestle my brother that happens to be a dire ferret. Well, they must oh, yeah. protect the water. Fight <laughs> <laughs> the ferret. I, I was going to say, yeah, for me, themes, I, I find they help my creative process. You know, I, I find that otherwise my brain doesn't know what to focus on. So I try to come up with something, even if it's like literally Googling themes. And then you get a list of like 50 themes and you're like that, that one looks pretty cool. And then it, you kind of make the next five games about this thing. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be something too rambunctious or too, too, too impressive or whatever, but you know what? Love, you want to have a love arc. You, you got these like love starstruck lovers who are separated and you try to get them back together. Something like this. I don't know. I just, I find it really can be like a spark plug 
when you are running out of inspiration for what what the next adventure hook is going to be or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, anything that gets the creative process starting, you know, there's that there's that thread that you get at one point where the module starts writing itself, but it can be hard to find that spot. Yeah. All right, let's see. Um, the next question that we have comes from <clears throat> uh, comes from Zeal Zaddy from Scott. And Scott would like to know, what is the best way you've ever incorporated your IRL animal companions into your games, streams, or products? Pretty sure everybody that watches my stream regularly knows that at least one of my cats will make an appearance on stream at some point. So I commemorated the whole thing just by getting a cat emote. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a channel point redemption for uh, treats for kitties. So, you know, they know this. They are very aware of this. They hang out in my room during streams. <laughs> well, my kitty cat, um, our kitty cat, appears on our YouTube, Adventure Away MD on YouTube. So you'll see this setting a little different. And it's the how to play series that my wife Apple does. Um, so I do some camera work and some stuff. What she runs it herself mostly. But one of our cats is quite rambunctious and likes to get up into whatever you're doing. So like almost every one of her videos, the cat has come to like knock pieces off the board and <laughs> like grab cards and eat them and then bat at us while we're trying to like manage him. <laughs> He's fully integrated content. His name's Nico, named after Nico and the Sword of Light, and his attitude tracks for that character. <laughs> <laughs> Little barbarian. Back when we were having in-home games, uh, before we moved, um, we have two pugs, and in-home games were their favorite because it was just lap time, and just throughout the night they would have like a different lap, and <laughs> just kind of rotate around the table. <laughs> It's like the buffet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're 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 kind of obsessed with cuddles. They can't you cannot refuse pug cuddles. <laughs> yeah, I mean like the, the little curly tail. The power yeah. of the curly tail. Yeah. The little snorty face. <laughs> like how can you not when they just shove it in? <laughs> it's like, no. Exactly. Let's cuddle. I too am a dog person. Um and while my dog is not like a character or a companion in any of the campaigns that I play in or run because I would get extremely offended if anything happened to said animal companion. Um, I do occasionally forget to take his collar off when we are recording, so you might hear him jingling in the background <laughs> as he walks around. Um, All good. But he, yeah, he's essentially become kind of our podcast group mascot because I call him the disaster dog and randomly share pictures of him anyway and he I would I would put him on screen but he's 70 70 pounds so that's a little too much for me to lift up to the camera and he is currently asleep um, but Oliver Twist all the, also known as Ollie the disaster dog and he is the biggest ham <laughs> he would fall asleep on my players when we were playing 3-5 in person <laughs> And that's a lot of dogs to fall asleep on. Yeah. yeah it's a strength check. <laughs> Kept you warm? I don't have a pet, so I don't have ah. any pet stories. That's I'll tragic. That. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any times that, like, our pets have actually gotten involved uh, mostly like when I play in person games, you know, if I ha host at my house, my cats are prone to stealing people's seats at the table. Um, you know, things like that. But <laughs> yes, Scott in chat reminded me that I do have a puppet animal that I made for his game. Nice. This is, uh, that, this, that is this is cadence, the tabaxi. Sock puppet tabaxi, and I want to say a month ago, Scott. I forget how long ago that was, but he we did a 
a live stream of a bunch of different sock puppets and some like cadence is the wor- worst looking one like all the other ones were oh, I, f- I forget that there was um there was like a a, a, a keiku or a bird a, some kind of bird Kenku? yeah a character and he like the the character had wings and like this full-on beak and everything like it was go go you gotta go find that zibble zabble theater got does it i think two or three times now and uh yeah it was some of those some of the the effort that people put into creating those sock puppets were chef kiss like they were amazing yeah (laughs) it's it's like you hear it you go well why would you ever play a game without puppets right (laughs) (laughs) that's it we're changing everything That was actually a topic that came up. Uh, we can't, we could not, for the life of us, remember where it came from. But it actually came up on this stream uh, when Scott was a guest one time, and somebody had mentioned something about puppets, and we all just went, "Time out! Like <laughs> this needs to be a thing." So yeah, it was great. Scott took it and ran with it, and and uh, has been doing an awesome job with it. So I I love it. I think it's so much fun. Like, why wouldn't you play with puppets? Like, it just makes so much sense. That's oh, a- yeah, for sure. And some of the, yeah, like I said, some of the puppets were fantastic. Um, I have yet to actually bring Cadence into my home game, but I'm going to have to do that because why wouldn't you? You, know, you just have them pop up behind the <laughs> behind the Game Master screen, you know? I think that would get a good oh laugh out of it. Oh, my gosh, Yes. They could be like every shopkeep, including if they go to a different town, he's just wearing a different hat. Oh my oh god. My gosh. It's like what's his name from Zelda? Yes. The 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 Beetle? Beetle. Yes. yes. It's yes. happening. That's a oh, fantastic idea. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. We're here to make your games better. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my new tagline for this show. <laughs> Oh, that sounds like great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um and uh Julian was back with another question and and Julian wants to know if you stream, do you also play home games still either digital or in person? I'm going to tag that on to also add podcast. <laughs> Well, this Friday will be my first time ever streaming, so I have only played home games before this. <laughs> well, uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, totally, completely so. Um, I was doing mostly home games prior to the podcast. It even started as a home game. That's why it starts with them as level three instead of one. Mm-hmm. Um, but... It's like, I enjoy gaming and TTRPG too much to have it just be the job, because if it was only that game, and that's all that I was involved with, then it would become kind of a second job or a task, and that's less fun. Mm -hmm. So I'm... I'm going to be doing the stream, I do the podcast, but... I also participate in whatever home games I get invited to. I run the GURPS one, which I love the story and I love the players, even if I'm not a fan of the system. Um, I, for a while, was doing an annual um, holiday game that just local people got invited to um, that like had a wait list among my fr- friends because we all just enjoyed doing the ongoing um, holiday game every December. Uh, So if I don't have that secondary aspect of being able to do it away from having to be on for an audience, it just, it gets too much. Yeah, I don't stream yet. I actually want to do some uh, DM commentary content while I play video games. So that'll be fun, but like no real stress on D&D. But I am still doing Mm -hmm. pro games and they're very big one shots. So I don't get a lot of permanence out of it. Um, but I am getting just a lot of DM hours in the in the bank. And at this point, it's not like I need more of it, but I'm always finding something to improve. 
But then after like a year or two of that, I was like, I really just need to play and be casual. So I, I, I play on the side. So I'm in a Pathfinder group and a fifth edition group. And, and I like that because, you know, despite like these, the big waves of, you know, preparation and then getting all your stuff together, going, getting through the, the one shot, finishing it out. And then like you kind of crash there's this like you know two casual games i can go to where i'm just bringing my character sheet i'm just thinking about what happened last time how's my character changing and developing how is he in there dealing with this situation as opposed to like eight to twelve npcs and how they do that which is <laughs> you know but yeah like after being a you know forever dm for a while i definitely had to take a break and say no i gotta like self-care me a little and mm. play something why, why do you mind if I ask? You know, running the games at the inn, that you know at the bread and breakfast, that must have its own dynamic too, right? Like you're you, you're kind of putting on a show for the not putting on a show, but you, you know what I mean. Like you're you're providing a service to the people that are coming to these games. How is that run differently than than a, a home game? I think that there's a dynamic element to it that you want to be very aware of your pacing. So, like. In a longer running campaign, you can end on an unsatisfying note on one day, or just be in a cliffhanger or road travel, and you're like, "Well, I know I'm gonna, we're gonna come back, we're gonna go to the big bad, we're gonna find the dungeon eventually." But when you're bringing in, sometimes people that don't know each other and they're meeting for the first time, they haven't done a lot of pre-prep ahead of time. They may or may not continue on to play after, but like, you just kind of gotta get it there. So. I think a lot of it is building in a little bit of time up front for people to kind of ease in and be casual. And that's like we do a session zero in the mm -hmm. first few hours. And then that way, when they go to sleep on their first night, like they're already got their wheels turned and they're aiming things. They're thinking about what the party's going to do next. And then it's just like a freight train on Saturday. So there's an art to the afternoon of like the pieces are moving around the table. There's plot points that are progressing. And like I can, I try to pick something that I think is a goal that they can accomplish within the hours of the end of the day, and just make sure that things are in proximity so that they can confront them, and they might still get squirrely and go off and hang out and shop too long at the tavern or something. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, just providing the opportunity where if they sense it, they can you know realize like, oh, we just got a little time left, let's go for it, and then they start you know getting to whatever their final confrontation is going to be. And sometimes it's not encounter it's, or the encounter is not combat. Um, we had one where it was just rally as much as the town as possible because these people were coming to ransom the town and we had to show them that the town was defensible. And so it's just a lot of talking to people and getting materials moved around town. And yet, even though they didn't roll initiative, like it was still, people were getting up and cheering and it was a great time and they protected the, the port. Um, so those are the challenges, just trying to make sure that like there's a satisfying beat at some point in the day, preferably near the end. Um, you don't want it to just fizzle out. And mm -hmm. it's an art form I've been perfecting for a few years. And it might work for you too. Like I started out doing this for my own group. Like we yeah. just go get cabin, get food. It's doable. We realized, oh, this is hard and we can take a lot of the, you know, headache out of this and I people see. can just you know, come and join. Cool. 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 Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't stream any kind of games or anything, so I, I have little to say here, but I, I do, I do want to say that running games and playing in games, both provide their distinct advantages and perspectives for like, you know, I'm a very, I'm a person who likes to dissect everything. So, so playing in, playing in a different game, running a game provides me different perspectives that I, I, I like to think influence um, influence the discussions that I have with the guests on my show. So yeah, for sure. They're valuable. Both sides of the coin are equally as valuable as the other two. Yeah, to that point, um, I think, you know, I I learned a lot when I started streaming um, campaigns a couple years ago and campaigns and one shots a couple years ago because it opened up so many different styles of play to me that I wouldn't have experienced had I only continued playing with my home group. Mm. I love my home group, you know, nothing against them, but I realized that the more I got into playing in streamed games, not because they were streamed, but because of the people that I met 
along the way doing it, um, I realized like, oh, this is not like the how my home group plays doesn't match how I want to play the game anymore. And I never would have realized that had I not started streaming them. But that said, there's a lot to be said because when you're streaming a an actual play, there's a performance measure to it. You're very aware of being on camera and not having too much dead air and you know, you you know, it it's well, it's great if it feels like it's a group of people, you know, just playing in someone's basement. It's not in in the respect that like if you if you want it to be that way, if you want your stream to be that way, then by all means, like, you know, that's what you want your stream to be, go for it. Like, but to some extent, most people that are streaming D&D are looking for a more professional not necessarily critical role, but a more professional setting to play in. And mm-hmm. so there's very much is that like performance piece. And, you know, I would always finish a game and I'd be like, oh, my God, the first thing I had to do was like shut off all my lights and, you know, like get away from the camera and walk away from the computer and that sort of thing. Like I just needed, um, you know, that downtime. And I was just having a conversation with someone earlier today where I was saying that, you know, you get anybody that streamed knows that there's like a post stream adrenaline rush and then you have a post game adrenaline rush. And so you put the two together and you're up for like three hours after your game has ended. (laughs) And so, you know, I'd be like, my game would end at 11. I wouldn't fall asleep until close to one and I'd have to be up by six, you know? So it was like, yeah, this makes for a very, very short night. Um, so I don't do those very often for just that reason. But, uh, you know, getting out of a, an actual campaign was probably the best thing I ever did. And now I just really play and streamed one shots for that exact reason, because I get done and I'm just like, Oh, I'm going to be up for another three days, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but I think there's, there's really a lot to be said too, for sort of the comfort of like the, you know, the off camera play and, you know, just getting to be goofy and fun and silly and not caring if it takes you five minutes to answer, you know, like, Well, no, you do care if it takes five minutes to answer, like, this is what my character is doing during combat. But, you know, like, you're less aware of the time than you would be if you're all just sitting there silently in front of a camera. (laughs) So. There's a little magic to that, though, of the streaming that, um, you know, I experienced that high after our big one shots. And yes, I'm up till 1 a.m. Um, But, like, I love that time because the time up to then is all this pressure, you know, like. I'm going to try to make sure that I'm composed, that Mm -hmm. we have good moments, that I'm going to, you know, weave the story in a way that stays interesting, that doesn't have a lot of downtime, you know, keep people engaged. But then at the same time, like, you see all the variables, like, intertwining, and you're thinking, like, all the ways it could go off the rails. And then when you finally get there and you land that thread that gets you to the end, you realize, like, we wrote the story. We got it in the can. It is the way it is, and I love certain parts of it, and just... You know, I will play the game over in my head multiple times. I'll try to, like, shut myself off and just, like, no, I want to turn on Netflix or something. But, like, I always just end up buzzing about it. It's crazy. Yeah. Yep. I have noticed that there's a lot less drop from home games. There's a lot less drop from home games. I wonder, I mean, this is totally speculation on my part, but I wonder if some of that is for some of the things that we're saying, it's less that performance, you know, you don't feel like you're performing. You don't feel like there's that added stress of, um, you know, being on camera or being recorded. Um, maybe, I don't know. Like, like the, the VTT, like non streamed, non recorded games, even I seem to have more drop from than I do when I'm running at a home table with people around me. And that may be like the extrovert coming out of me again, um, where like I'm able to share the energy with the people around me because they're there. But I have actually noticed that when I was running the three five games in person and when I'm able to run the games in person still, um, I have a lot less drop and I have a lot less come down that I have to deal with. Uh, than when it's with either strangers or just over VTT. Yeah, that makes sense to me. 
All right. Let's see. Dungeon Glitch had a question. Matt would like to know, yeah. what are some skills you've seen among other players or DMs that you've admired and been inspired by? And I responded in chat by saying... I could talk about this for hours <laughs> because there are so many amazing people out there. Yes. yes. Uh, I can shout out to a couple of people I know. Um, you know, I, I still admire like a lot of the bigger visibility streams like Critical Role. Um, although I find that my influence has now just gone to character work. So, like, I'm looking for people that stream and they have a certain accent or they're analyzing characters in films and I can, like, learn how to work on NPCs and that sort of thing. But, like, I work with a dungeon master, Brian. He's part of Adventure Away. And I love his style. And he creates these very rich worlds that have, like, a large social structure around them. So there are towns and they have alliances and trade with others and there's people that are wealthy and they have certain connections and then they you know manipulate things and there's a lot of like mystery and intrigue like he has he has a module that's very similar to murder on the orient express and i always thought that was very cool so you know i'm i'm i think i probably do less puzzle work and less mystery and i'd love to start mastering that and looking for that Uh, okay, so um, I don't play in as many as I run, but I do watch a lot and listen to a lot. Um, like Alex from Bards and Brews, one of the reasons why I first started watching Bards and Brews, they have the most like engaging way. Like it's not just that they describe well, but they have good description and embodiment of NPCs or things happening around them. But the way that they do it is really engaging to both their players and the audience so that you get to experience what they're describing in a way that it's just beyond like you're reading something off of a paper that has just like a well-written description. Um, so like that's one of the things that I really, really admire about Alex and I've kind of been stealth studying them um, to try and incorporate a little bit of that into the way that I DM because I am a very, very improv DM and I do a lot of yes and with mm -hmm. my characters, my players. Um, but because of that, it can be a very halting description sometimes. And Matt, who asked the question, has also DM'd for me, and he does amazing, like, structural world building. Um, like, the way that he has everything set up is not necessarily fully unique, but very, very different than you generally experience, and there are a lot of unique qualities to it, and it is very intricately designed, and how much thought he has put into it is just absolutely phenomenal. So I'm trying to do a little bit more of that into my creation on some of the games, though it doesn't work for all of them. Uh, but he has some amazing world building and the details into how the economy works and how he has set up for certain flaws in the D&D system and everything. So he's another one that I fully admire within like our uh, peer space. And then, of course, I have... like desperate fangirl measure for Ebria because um, I, I, I worship at the ground that Ebria walks on. <laughs> um, so everything about the way that she GDMs, I just adore. But that's just me gushing like a fangirl, so I'm not going to get into that. I would agree with, with I mean, yeah, you, you can't go wrong with Ebria. Um, but I think for me, like with her, um, uh, with Brennan Lee Mulligan, like when I watch people like that, what I get from it is like how much fun they're having. And that's not something I see from like every DM because DMing's hard. It's a lot of work and you're putting all these things together and it's very easy to get into like DM brain and just like either be against your players or just sort of be kind of in your own world. And when I watch those DMs that like look like they're playing a game, look like they're having fun, 
and adding to that story, like, that's when you have me hooked. Yeah. She cheers along with them. It's amazing. Yes, yes I love it. Yeah. That's a fantastic point. And it's something that took me way too long to learn, too. Like, you know, I always thought my games, my players can joke around and and make, my home games anyway, you know, they can joke around, they can make jokes, but I gotta be the one that, like, puts us back on track. Right. And no, no, that couldn't be further from the truth. Like, if I contribute to the ridiculousness and laugh along with all of these jokes, it makes it more fun for me and, and... that's kind of the intention. I, so I agree with you. The game master has to have a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, all, all those big visibility game masters are, you know, they're, they're ex- ex- extremely uh, inspirational. Brennan, you know, Brennan for sure. I, I he His ability to take a one moment where you're just like laughing hysterically to then switching into high gear and talking about how you know a specific character and 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 their lived experience and their emotional baggage comes into play is just incredible um again in the in the peer space for me somebody that i I recently spoke to was rhett from stack of dice he runs uh, a family friendly podcast actual play and his descriptions of things are incredible I, i i've never you know listened to somebody have like a five not maybe not five minute but you know like a description of a, an environment or a flashback or he calls these things called up and away moments where you you uh, you leave the party to to see a moment somewhere else in the world to me that was in- incredibly interesting and, and inspirational and i want to kind of copy that in in my game mastering in the way that i provide my synopsises for instance or things like this where he really touches on this evocative language that puts you in a position and, and puts you there. You feel the sensations of the environment you're in, in a way that I, I, I want to try to emulate. Um, I also have a player. I'm going to shout out Vince, who is not in the tabletop RPG sphere at all. Like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have any any of these Twitter or Instagram handles. But anyway, v- Vince, I find as a player, does something that I wish all of my players did, and I wish I did as a player. In that, whenever he engages with something, he always opens another door for the game master. You know, you he, he's he'll decide out of the blue that he's going to write a letter to an NPC that he met five games ago, and ask for their advice and ask them to send help. And it's like, you know what? You just you're doing my job for me. You're you're giving me these opportunities to bring somebody back into the, bring an NPC back into the game or ask for help or, or things like this. So I, I think there's there's something there for everybody to learn um, and something that I want to try to do more is make sure that as a player my engagement with the world doesn't just kind of bring closure but that it opens other opportunities for my game master to bring things that he's you know that the game master has seeded in the past so yeah and sorry Lydia you were going to say something I feel you're good okay <laughs> I like all this advice. I think there's some genuine wisdom to letting people be silly and letting that be a part of your world. That the fourth wall is there to protect certain things, but like, you know, the, if if you find that your players need to make jokes and they want to like, you know, be silly about stuff, like you can just let your characters live next to them, and they might be confused if they make a Deadpool reference, but you know, you can roll with it and just have them take it as an insult or take it as a curiosity and then just let them play through. Cause you know, your players are the content. The players are what makes those moments. The more you can draw them out into like, I'm going to pet every horse or I have to open every door I see. Like it just creates more that you don't have to force, you know, you can write the story around what they do. And especially with live streams, these characters become lovable and people follow mm-hmm. them. So they really are genuinely these stars. Yeah, yeah, you you know it's 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 okay to embrace the out, off the rails moments. Um, it's it, it can be fun. I something that my I like to do with my players is I allow them to name NPCs that they come across, and it's gotten to the point now where we have like four different famous chefs for some reason. Like uh, one one character that I really like is Gordon of the Rammed Sea, and he is. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's a you know it's a pirate campaign so it makes sense anyway so yeah he, he's uh, recently joined their crew and anyway they just do this thing and it's like you know what let's just go let's just have it he's gonna have a lamb chop scene like it's gonna happen there's no way he's not gonna be upset about the <laughs> lamb chops being undercooked you know what i mean <laughs> got the bread around he's like what am i <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I did a one shot one time sort of to that uh, to that same same thing. Uh, and it, there was a character because it was a one shot and we were trying to keep it really lighthearted. Um, they played a character named uh, Dustin. What was it? Wood Woods Pond, Dustin Woods Pond, as opposed to Justin Timberlake. And. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, the deity of Dustin Woods Pond was Mikhail Jackson. (laughs) And it was like, you know, stuff like that was just like, it was such a riot. You know, I mean, we all as players knew exactly what was happening, but it was, oh my God, it just made it so fun. And so as part of this character, like they would challenge everybody to a dance off. Like everybody, that was their thing. Like they didn't want to have combat; Valid. they would have a dance off. Valid. So he leads a horse over and goes, "Oh, this is my young horse, uh, sexy back." <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am bringing it. I am bringing my horse, sexy back. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, we are about at the point where we need to start wrapping up for the evening. So what I would like to do is give everyone a chance to go around again and just remind us of who you are and what you do and where we can find you on social media and anything you have coming up that you would like to share. Um, We generally do this in the opposite direction of when we start. So, Matt, we're going to start with you this time. All right. Well, thank you, Luna, for having having me back. Tales of the Tavern is amazing. And I would be on it every week if I could. Um, and thank you to everybody for their insights. It's a pleasure meeting everyone. Um, I'm Matt. You can find me on Twitter. It's a role underscore play underscore chat. I like to tweet about all things tabletop RPG. I like polls, especially. I especially like taking something that shouldn't be binary and making it binary and being like, make a decision. Are you for this or against this? And then tell me why. And then I like to see people be like, but you can't. You can't. Just- <laughs> It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then, of course, you can listen to Roleplay Chat on any podcasting platform of your choice. Uh, episodes are bi-weekly. I've been doing it for a long time now, so there's this big back catalog. But don't feel like you have to listen from the beginning. You know, episodes are self-contained. So you can find a topic that interests you. You want you're, you know, you're working on traps this week, so you want to get some insights on traps, go find the trap episode or, or whatever. So, yeah, um, go, check, go check that out wherever you listen to podcasts. And yeah, that's me. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming back on. Uh, as I just put in chat, I might know someone that could help with scheduling if you ever wanted to come back. So, so. <laughs> uh, but thank you uh, so much. It's always great to have you on. I know um, I always love getting the chance to chat with you. So, um, yeah. Uh, Lydia. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Um, I'm Lydia. I write uh, monster romance stories. You can find those on my website, uh, lydiasnerdverse.com. I'm also at Lydia's Nerdverse on all social media platforms, so you can come check me out there. And this Friday, we'll be premiering uh, Rangers of the North, which is going to be a Lord of the Rings TTRPG uh, actual play show on DMDM Studios Twitch channel. So you can come find me there. I'm going to be playing a human warrior with a battle fury flaw, so a lot of anger and not being able to stop swinging the giant sword I have. So good times. Amazing. I'm a fan already. <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, for coming on and, and hanging out. Uh, I, I loved getting to have you. So um, it was great to, it was great to get to meet you. You know, yeah. I always say that it's always nice to put a, a, a name to a Twitter handle. So right. <laughs> um, Wayne, <laughs> Well, hell, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name, again, is Wayne Denier. I'm the head dungeon master at Adventure Away with my lovely wife, Apple, who you would 
be able to speak to if you contacted us at adventurewaymd at gmail.com. Um, we're also on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter at adventurewaymd, um, as well as YouTube. Um, we have games coming up this year for the bed and breakfast. There's games in May, August, and October where you can just drop in and book a room, including a game that's in that's Potterverse adjacent and a 5e homebrew, and a portion of those uh, sales will go to the Trevor Project. But we also have an Avatar The Last Airbender game that is in August. Um, we also have private parties available May, June, July, August, September, October. So if you have your own crew, we can make a game off the menu for you guys. Um, so yeah, follow us on social media and hit us up on our website, adventurewaymd.com. I know. I'm like, I really need to take a vacation at some point. So, <laughs> so anybody who wants to come with me, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, Wayne, thank you so much for coming on. It was a blast to get to know you a little bit. And, uh, you know, hopefully at some point I will get to uh, get to make my way down there to visit. So, um, all right. And uh, and Evie. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. It was really great getting to meet all of you and like answer some weird questions and everything. <laughs> um, so I am Evie the Disaster DM. You can find me on Twitter either at Dias <laughs> at Disaster DM underscore Evie or uh, I'm the one that also runs the podcast's Twitter account, which is DN Disaster Story. Our website is dndisasterstory.com and we're on pretty much all of the different podcasting platforms as D and disaster story we went like all in on the name um and then as also previously mentioned first heard here on tales from the tavern i will be uh dming into the fog with uh bards and brews every other tuesday starting at the end of this month i believe on the 26th which is a dark fairy tale strahd inspired homebrew thing that got put together <laughs> uh well i it sounds like it's going to be awesome so i i hope it goes very well and i'm definitely going to try to fun. yeah i'm definitely going to try to check that out because i am i am very curious about it so thank you so much for coming on this was great uh great to have you and great to get to know you a little bit so um I am Gabriel Rom Luna. This has been Tales from the Tavern. We are here just about every Sunday night. I say just about because I am gearing up for a break in May. Um, so uh, we're here just about every Sunday night uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific time. And um, let's see, stuff coming up for me. Uh, this coming Thursday night, I will actually be guesting over on the uh, Community Cleric stream with uh, Sarah who was on here a couple of weeks ago. So I am, uh, I am super excited about that. Um, looking forward to being on the receiving end of all of the questions <laughs> um, instead of being the one asking all of the questions. So, um, so that will be a lot of fun. And, uh, and then coming up in May, uh, May 8th, we have the 100th episode of Tales from the Tavern. So super excited about that. I, uh, I, am, I, I can't believe it's been almost 100 episodes already. So um, we've got some amazing people coming on that day. We're going to have some giveaways. It's going to be awesome. And then um, coming up uh, after that, I'm going to be taking a few weeks off so that I can prep for two big fundraisers. Uh, we will be returning with Tales from the Tavern in June. And that will be, uh, we will be coming back with a fundraiser for World Central Kitchen. And uh, we're basically doing uh, Tales from the Tavern meets Hot Ones. So we are ordering hot sauces from all around the world. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I got to have some great conversations with, uh, with one of the guests who is helping do all the planning. And uh, so we've got this whole list of hot sauces we're going to try. And we even found one from Antarctica. <laughs> we're super excited about that. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's going to be a blast and that's how we're going to kick off the brand new season, season four in June. Um, so be sure to come back for that and, uh, help us raise, my goal is to raise $500 for a really amazing charity that's doing some really incredible work all around the globe, especially, uh, helping the people of Ukraine and, um, 
yeah, that's it. So we got some busy stuff uh, coming up. Um, so stay tuned. Feel free to follow on Twitter if you want to stay up to date with everything. And uh, that's about it. So let's see. We are going to go pay a visit to... I think we're going to, we were all talking about like the post stream high and all of that stuff for, for a little bit. So we're going to take it down a notch and we are going to go pay a visit to my good friends over at Turtles and Chill. And if you are not familiar with Turtles and Chill, they are a 24 hour turtle and fish tank stream where they pay, they play lo-fi music and it's just super chill and uh, a really good time. So we're going to go over there and say hi to them. And I hope you all have a great, uh, great week and we'll see you all next Sunday. Take care. I should go. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Tales from the Tavern. You can catch this podcast recorded live every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv forward slash Gamer Mom Luna. All of our questions come directly from chat, so we never really know what to expect when we go live. If you ever have a question or would like to add something to the conversation, feel free to reach out on Twitter at Gamer Mom Luna and use the hashtag TFTT. You may just get to hear it answered. Thanks so much. I should go.